Um, Collier's International France, I can't start without obviously pitching what Collier's France is. Um, and like Richard, I'll be very, very quick, but you can read a very sizable company. We've been in the market for many, many years uh, with Collier's uh, and Collier's International since 2015. Uh, I bought a company that's very, very occupier focused, but we've built around, uh, around that occupier focus one of the biggest occupier large market shares in terms of uh, transactions in the uh, tenant representation business. We've added in huge amounts of resources in terms of transactions on the agency and obviously in the investor side capital markets, um, 65 million. So what we like to say is we're big, we're big enough, but still small enough to be very, very relevant in all your needs. And so I've stopped pitching and move on to the executive summary. Economic growth is back. 2% sounds like it's a huge, massive, uh, for the French anyway, improvement of where things are. Relative to other countries, 2% is not compared to the US or in North America where you're talking about 3 4% growth. 2% in, um, in France is actually quite a very, very, very meaningful uh, level of growth. Um, but what's important is how they've gotten there and that that 2% will stable get going forward. Stability and what's, moving, what's happening moving forward. Macromania, uh, it's easier to say in French, Macromania, it, it just sounds better <laughs> than Macron mania. Um, um, but there's a certain amount of that. We'll have a slide later on and we'll talk a little bit about it, what it means and may, may not mean. I think the biggest point in, that I can leave you with about Macron, despite uh, his looks and his choice of words in Australian uh, women and so on, and delicious women, et cetera, and those gaffes, generally speaking, Macron obviously had huge positive influence. Myth reality, we'll come back to that later, but in terms of investors and so on, and settling things down and giving people a way of looking at France and being able to have some vis vis visibility, at least in the medium term, is what Macron is about. Um, Grand Projet, um, the Olympics, and obviously all the infrastructure project around the Grand Paris is a huge, massive undertaking and it's not so much about what it'll actually do and opening up freeing up land for development which we'll talk about when we get to Steve and Grosvenor and what they're doing and how they perceive the market it's more about the shift in the focus that the French have had regarding the way that they look at the region the way that they look at infrastructure and connectivity around around the city um, and what that means for the whole commercial real estate sector extremely important. So the Olympics in itself, as in those of you who are in London, and what that means in terms of Stratford and East London, etc. Same sort of feeling, um, but the Grand Projet around the Paris area will come to it, but it's, it's, it adds to the general picture of where France is going, where the Paris region is going. Um, in terms of Brexit, this is really, I was going to use a word which I probably, I just held back, but Brexit really is not an issue for, for a couple of reasons we'll, we might get into. It's more about the investment and the ability of people to say, listen, um, Brexit has, looked at, has forced some investors to look outside of London, look outside of the UK, and look at France. In terms of jobs, in terms of the impact in an inflow of people and the choice of people to, to move their people into Paris, uh, my view is it's very, very limited. But there's an indirect, again, an indirect impact of Brexit on the Paris market, which is positive. And then strong property fundamentals. Um, Paris uh, is a market which Peak de Trough in the last cycle. Um, we'll, we'll show a little bit about that later. But Peak de Trough through the cycle isn't as volatile as the German market, the UK market, and the Spanish market in particular, for example. So this notion of volatility, the lack of volatility, is good and bad, depending on where you, where you are in terms of investment and the way that, how opportunistic, opportunistic you are. But that lack of volatility relative to other cycles, other companies, uh, other countries, um, is extremely positive trend for France and the way that investors should be looking at that market. <coughs> Unique selling point. France key facts. So this is the bit of the presentation where I sound like a French tourism board uh, member representative. Um, but very, very simple. Largest country, uh, third largest, second largest economy, the infrastructure, uh, with the E obviously not connected to the rest of the word. I'm sorry for that. Um, highest birth rate, um, almost at replacement levels of two per, per couple. Uh, which is very interesting in terms of long-term trends, in terms of the economy, its ability to grow, its ability to sustain that growth, and so on. Um, and uh, ultra high net worth individuals. Uh, obviously, it attracts a lot of foreign investment, both personal and in terms of commercial uh, and company corporate investments. So some key facts to keep in mind. Um, and then Paris, because obviously Paris and the dichotomy between Paris, and this is where the panelists can also talk about Paris versus regions. Um, very, very centralized country, as you all know, meaning that obviously in terms of Paris, which is 
one of the largest uh, commercial real estate markets in the world at 54, uh, 54 million square meters, um, it doesn't leave a lot of space for the regions to exist. We can come back and allow the panelists to respond to you. Is there value in Marseille, in Lyon, and Toulouse, and so on? Obviously there is, but Paris obviously is the, the key topic for anyone who wants to enter the market. You want to understand Paris, understand how it works, and then relative value to that, risks and so on, versus other areas of, of France. Got to start with Paris. Um, highest GDP, it is one of the largest and is the largest city in Europe. Technological hub, air hub being the center of Europe, as they like to say. Um, it is practical. I've always run pan-European teams. Being in Paris, it's very easy to move from Paris, go to Spain, go to, to, uh, go to the eastern parts of, of Europe, go to, into, into Italy, um, into London, and so on. You are at the center of the universe, as the French would say. Um, um, but it's not just, it's it, from the plane and from uh, investment, and also in terms of getting toward your clients and so on. Paris obviously has a lot of attrait. Largest portfolio. As I just said, 54, square, uh, 54 million square meters. La Défense, a lot of people uh, like La Défense, a lot of people don't. But in terms of large, uh, large floor plates and the ability to put a large people back office or not in La Défense, you've got a very different and very offer around Paris and its region. La Défense is part of that. So depending on your needs, Paris can sort you out. Um, and other headquarters, foreign investors, foreign finance, obviously, first, second, largest uh, or second largest in Europe, if not the world. Um, and in terms of macro, macro, macroeconomic view, I think the first slide I wanted to, 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 uh, to provoke you and, and discuss a little bit about uh, macromania before we get into the statistics. Um, in dinner parties, I think you can get very, very excited and overwhelmed <coughs> by what Macron has done. I think it's not so much what he's done, it's more about what he represents versus prime ministers of the past. Um, the previous two or three, four, five, six have really been extremely unimpressive in their ability to reform, take up the challenges that France um, has been through since 1968. <coughs> so we're obviously at a very interesting confluence in its history, 1968, in terms of the student revolution and so on. We're seeing that in the streets and again, again, and we can come to that. But what Macron has provided, despite some of these reforms, which individually aren't earth shattering, none of them really represent much for the commercial real estate sector individually. What it does do and what it does mean, uh, and to be provocative, is that when you add it all up, it does provide a certain backstop for investors in terms of understanding what's happening, that we're finally moving towards uh, normalcy in the way that investors can look at France, compare it to other markets without having things change day to day. Uh, Francois Hollande and the previous government, they came in and within 18 months, 24 months, they had gone from changing the tax code to rechanging the tax code to add taxes and so on. Many investors don't care how you tax them, they just want to know what it is. And then they can make their decisions, they can put everything in a spreadsheet and decide what transfer tax is, they can decide what the laws are and how to structure um, their acquisitions. Once you have that, then you can make a decision to do, not do. And the Francois Hollande period, even before in Sarkozy, you didn't have any notion of stability and visibility on what the government was going to do. Macron has set out a plan, he's sticking to it, you can disagree with it or not, but at least you have the visibility and the ability to then take view on the market and what that means for you as investors. Um, individually, uh, there's no point talking about, uh, about some of these things. Obviously, you've seen the SNCF and the reforms progress to come um, in terms of the, the public sector, uh, 120,000 jobs to be suppressed, which is a great sign for foreign investors and so on. Um, obviously, the rating agencies might give France its AAA status back in terms of its sovereign debt if they move that along. However, you've seen in the streets the last couple of days, obviously, the French are not necessarily pleased by what's going on. But the government is staying true to its word, it's continuing to do what it's saying, and it's at least giving the, uh, and allowing us to be very, very confident that they'll stay the course, which is what, as investors and as actors in the economy, we all expect and want. Um, GDP, the 2%. Um, it sounds like it's extremely, uh, at least for the French, exciting to be at 2%. Uh, again, it, it doesn't make anyone um, overexcited. It doesn't stop anyone sleeping at night. Um, but relative to other countries, France is always in a bit of a tunnel in terms of its ability to, to, to not live and, and through the vagaries of the volatility other countries face. 
so two percent in France with prospect of being around 2, 2.3, uh, 2.2, 2.3 in 2018, and some visibility for the next three years, is again, is the message I'd like to leave you with there. Unemployment rate, marked improvement. I should have put a question mark around that. Um, the, French, the French have been hovering around the 10% plus level for quite a while, um, and that's come in over the last, uh, uh, the last period, which has been seen as a huge marked improvement um, to be only uh, between eight and nine percent unemployment, which is still massive, but for them it's quite a quite a victory. Um, that employment obviously hides a lot of state aid and et cetera. But again, it's the trend, it's the visibility, and the impact that everything pulling together is having. And this is one of the indicators. Uh, foreign investment project in France. This is just to show a marked increase. Now, this has nothing to do with Macron, as you can imagine. Uh, Macron was, was was the ripe age in 2013 of 35 and was still making millions and millions in um, his previous investment banking experience at that time. Um, but you can see foreign investment. And this isn't real estate. We'll come to that in a moment. This is just foreign investment in France generally uh, from 2013 onwards. Marked improvement um, in, in France. Part of that is due to the stability that France is seen as in terms of the sovereign um, and in terms of its economy um, and going forward. So some very interesting facts and figures there. Um, the real estate market. Um, in terms of the economic growth uh, and real estate cycles, um, like all the countries, obviously you, you see a, a very, very discernible trend in terms of GDP. Um, what we'd like to compare it to the, the, the Paris office market. Again, the correlation between the Paris office market um, and the economy is as close as you can get in terms of representing what's going on. Um, and then what you see here, a couple of takeaways, um, is that the, in terms of uh, take up uh, in 2017-2018, um, if you notice, if you go back over to 2006-2007, you're at the very same levels pretty much, give or take. Okay, so take up, historically, uh, you, you, you are definitely on the upward side of the trend. But 2006, 2007, is this a warning signal? Does it mean that take up is then going to sort of taper off as we see in the chart there? Um, is that still significant enough? Is it something investors should be concerned about? A question to ask the panelists and where they think that things are going. But take up, at least as it's projected, still very robust and again, visibility. Um, real estate investment uh, in Europe, France top three. Um, obviously, big drop off off the big two, UK and Germany. The message for here, and I'll put my, my tourism board hat again, if you have plans to do uh, and invest in Europe, whether it's in debt or whether it's in property, uh, UK and Germany is obviously where you're bang for the buck in terms of adding resources, making your investments, building teams, getting operating partners. But France <coughs> is obviously the next one there. And in terms of diversification of portfolio, you can't look at Europe and not do France and not be in France. <coughs> my view. We'll see if Steve and the others believe that. <laughs> um, office prime yields and prime rents in Europe. This slide here, just to show you very quickly, when you compare it to, to, to London, uh, West End, um, obviously you, you're way off the chart here in terms of, in terms of uh, prime rents, um, but even the yield here compared to uh, Paris CBD, 3%. Paris was one of the first markets outside of London to correct um, after the cycle in terms of core um, and the, the yields and the compression of yields in the core sector and became very, very flooded with capital, uh, which either Chinese or even French and some of the foncières, et cetera. So at 3%, you're obviously in the very, very, very bottom end of the, the yield scale. But in terms of rent, at 800, you're definitely, again, um, even above Dublin and so on, no one's close to London, but a very, very core market. That's what this slide represents. Um, real estate investment in France, um, volumes. So as you saw in take up again, uh, very notable increase over the years, but trending to the 2006-2000 levels. Again, question for investors and so on in terms of whether we're at the top of the cycle, can it, is it sustainable based on growth, based on what Macron is doing and so on. Again, the big question, take up investment at those levels, sustainable, yes, no? That's a debate for us here. Um, investment in France, year of the logistic, uh, I will pass on that. <coughs> right, financial rates compared to real estate rates. Uh, I'm not an economist, um, but um, as you see, the, the yield gap between um, the 10-year uh, the bonds and uh, prime office yields 
um, the last couple of years, it's never been bigger. Um, is it important to look at that? Is it important to see the relative value? Um, quantitative easing um, as investors and relative value as investors. Where are you going? What is it in terms of the sovereign uh, rates and so on, um, depending on how your allocations divide up and depending on how you're built as a company. Um, if you're one of the larger asset managers with big parts of, of investments in and out of real estate, real estate and debt, uh, indirect or direct, you're obviously looking at this and trying to make decisions on whether you, you believe rates and quantitative easing are going to move up and what's the impact then obviously on the yields. Obviously this slide is suggesting that there will be a yield shift. Will that shield, will it compress to the point where it's still a 200 basis points gap? <clears throat> will that gap continue? Will it, so a couple of panelists obviously will be better placed to need to talk about it. But interesting to see the impact on the sovereign <coughs> um, 10 year government bond yield as it's moving at quantitative easing, what would the impact be obviously on the yield shift? Hark back to the previous slide, 3%. Can you go lower in terms of five yields? Not really. So take up five, I'm going to pass on these. Um, you'll get these in the, uh, in the book, but in terms of the uh, 5,000 square meters, I don't know, might pick up a little bit on this on the panel in terms of pre-letting, terms key schemes and so on. I'm not going to, I wanted to leave you with the Grand Paris project. So it was basically to, to not go into the details of it, uh, but tell you what it represents in terms of investment and what it will mean for Paris and what it means for France and how investors can and should look at France in a general sense. Um, a structural transport project. Um, we, we, we put it that way just to sort of give you a sense that at the heart of it, um, you're going to be creating uh, a certain level of connection. And I know from, from <coughs> the room, you've got the, the screens there, but basically you've got Paris, which has been a very hub and spoke system um, with people coming in office from the west or from the south or not so much in the north, but in the east coming into Paris. Now the connectivity around the Paris has been very, very poor other than the N104 and the A86, um, uh, which you can't see on the map here, but take my word for it. They exist. Um, but the project here is to link, uh, not cities, but to link poles. There's, we haven't represented on the slide here, but you have seven big poles, which would either be technologically, media, uh, et cetera, uh, R&D, and poles of excellence. And these poles of excellence will then exist in and across in Paris and around Paris. And what they're trying to do is, is connect it and connect Paris and put money into the infrastructure so that you, you, you have a, a, a more decentralized system, um, decentralized economy in and around Paris. What it will mean is that occupiers, and this is the big thing for us, um, based on the fact of how present we are with the occupier market in uh, Paris, and I'm pitching again, um, is, is where they want to go, new ways of working, wh how do they want their employees to be engaged, how do they want their employees to be working um, within uh, the, their corporate environments. Paris has a certain type of design floor plates, if you, unless you're in De La Défense or Saint-Denis, you have very small floor plates. Uh, there are still a lot of obsolete buildings, a lot of refurbishment is going on, but there's a certain constraint to what you can do and the way that you want people to work in those environments. So to create those new environments, you've got lots of options, and this will create over the next five to 10 years, a huge amount of optionality for companies to say, no, I don't need to be in Paris. I've got the ability to have my employees go to Massy Palaiso or to Montreuil, as Credit Agricole and some other banks have decided to do, to move out of Paris. Or at least say, I've got different optionalities of moving part of my business to back office or a data center and so on, and look at Paris very differently. So as occupiers decide and they, they realize that this project is coming forward, um, huge difference also in terms of employees. People are getting priced out of living in Paris. The impact on the residential market here, and it's the last theme I'll leave you with, residential <coughs> in Paris, as in London, um, home ownership is about the same level, around 68% around, around France. Paris is extremely difficult to buy. Uh, first time homeowners um, and, and people who are obviously entering um, the property market simply can't buy, buy property. So if you're allowing them and you're allowing talent to be able to exist outside the, uh, the actual center of Paris with the 75 CBD area, then you're able to provide a different working environment experience for them. So in terms of the impact on occupiers, where do they want to be? Um, the infrastructure will allow them to have more optionality to the, for them. 
employees will then not have to travel into Paris. They're going to want to say, listen, I don't want that job in Paris. I don't want to commute for two hours. I want to be here, there, there. So as investors and developers look around, uh, around Paris, I'm interested to see where that investment's going to go, which hubs will, will win over others. But you've got 68 new stations. You're going to have to put retail into them. The local councils are going to have to free up land. So the laws have to change for that to happen. And it sort of already has. Once you do that, then you've got to build out, obviously, office environments. So the whole projects around that, working with local councils, is a job that some of the big developers are doing. But people should be looking at that. But follow the occupier. Follow the money is what people say. I say follow, follow the occupiers. How they want to uh, engage their employees, where they want to be in this area, is really the key as this all plays out. In impact, then, in terms of residential, um, PRS, build to rent and scheme this on institutional money, that's maybe a question to discuss in terms of where are the new, uh, new pockets of, uh, of investment and possibility. 96% obviously of residential and investment is in the hands of the private individuals. Institutional have sold out of, of residential as an institutional investment product. As in the UK, I think it's 98%. Is it PRS? Is that something to think about? This, I think, is a motor for that. Take a view. Not. So that's what I'll leave you with. Um, and I'll just go back up. Here we are. It has a positive outlook for France. Again, visibility and stability. That's what Macron has, has brought. Um, in terms of the Grand Projet and then Brexit, the strong property fundamentals. France is obviously a market which, um, through the cycle, uh, suffered in terms of its image and so on. Uh, I don't think that it's necessarily been uh, fully appreciated how positive things in France have been. I do think that it's, it, there's a correction going on in terms of perception. A lot of it has been perception um, through the cycle. Um, and as we go forward, Macron was not the savior. I do think that the French and the way that the market is developing is in itself the, the positive trend that everyone should be looking at, investors. Um, so as the panel goes through and talks through some of these things, hopefully you'll be uh, keen enough to, to, to challenge us on that. Um, one question I'm sure we'll all be interested in is, where are the issues in France, other than giving a few hints about uh, where yields are, uh, investment, and where they're tracking? I'd be in the heart of the market. Other than that, we haven't told you where the challenges are. We'll leave that open for questions and for the panel, perhaps. So I'll leave it at that. I'm open to your questions. Um, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brett.